Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. How's everybody? Good. Well, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here. Honored to serve under our senior pastor, Marcus and Natalie Avalos. I'm getting to start off our new series, our Christmas series this year. And uh, if you haven't noticed, the theme of it is Charlie Brown. Uh, and I'll be honest, I have not watched anything Charlie Brown related for probably 35 years. So Pastor Marcus said, I want, you know, go, go, uh, let's do it, base it off of like some of the themes that are in Charlie Brown Christmas. And I was like, I haven't seen that movie since I was like 12. So he said, well, you got some homework to do. So uh, I went and found a DVD of Charlie Brown Christmas. By the way, did you know Apple bought all the Charlie Brown stuff and you have to subscribe to Apple to, and I was not going to give them $9.99. So I found a DVD of it and uh, watched it with my daughter and it was really cool. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that throughout this, this month as we're looking at the story of Jesus and, and that, that, that movie has a lot of the themes of the important things that, that uh, are Christmas are about. So I want to talk today specifically about Christmas feelings. Um, have you ever heard the word Christmas spirit, like the term Christmas spirit? Is that a thing that we still say, Christmas spirit? Yeah? What comes to mind when you hear the word, when you hear Christmas spirit? Peace, joy, Peace, joy kindness. kindness, Santa Claus, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful things. So um, when I was 18, I got a job at the airport, and uh, Christmas spirit came to take on a whole <laughs> new meaning. Uh, I got hired there in November, and you know I was just getting kind of getting the job figured out around mid-November, and I noticed this market difference around the third week of November in how people who were coming into the airport just the vibe they brought with them. Okay, and, I, and one of the guys that was training me, he said, "Oh, get ready! It's about time for Christmas spirit around here." And I was like, "Oh, Christmas spirit! How wonderful!" Well, listen, if the people that were coming into the airport did have a spirit, I'm pretty sure it was demonic. Um, because something happened around Christmas that some of the nicest people would turn horribly, horrible, just mean. I would see these sweet ladies coming in all in their like Christmas stuff, you got the jingle bells and Santa Claus, and then a flight would get delayed and be like, this demonic Christmas spirit would come out. I'm like, what is wrong with these people? Isn't this a time of joy and peace and happiness? But there was something that just ramped up, like these heightened emotions. And it got, it got I, I learned early on that there was this secret page that we would do at the airport over the loudspeaker. If somebody was getting out of control and we had to bring in airport security, there was this page. You, could, you weren't allowed to say over the speaker, please, airport security, please come to gate seven immediately. We have a psycho. You weren't allowed to say that. So what we would, what we would do is we, we had this secret code and you would go, paging A Gardner to gate seven immediately. A gardener, please come to gate seven. And you had to stay really calm so nobody would be freaking out, right? But we who worked at the airport knew, oh, Christmas spirit. Uh, when a gardener was called, the security was on their way. And we'd always be like, I'd be on break sometimes out here, like uh, a gardener to the American Airlines ticket counter. I'm like, oh, somebody lost their stuff at the Air American ticket counter. I'm gonna go chat what's up. Like, and you're watching people screaming and like, I'm trying to get to, don't you know I have to get to Chicago? And you know, the agent is like, look, you know, everybody here needs to get to Chicago. Like the delay, it's affecting all of us. And FYI, the delay actually affects the agent too. We did not like delays. Do you know why? Because the sweetest thing for an airport agent is to get you onto a plane and out of their face. And when that happens with a delay, you're in front of their face for a long time. So we came to like a, a gardener. It's just kind of the sign Christmas spirit is here. And like literally every day, be like a gardener. And you go down and somebody's, you know, a sweet little old lady denied boarding because she was too drunk to get on the plane. <laughs> you go, what's, you know, and she was like, oh, I'm just getting ready to see my family. But do you know you can't, it's illegal to get on a plane drunk. Did you know that? A little pro tip for some of you guys. Um, <laughs> because when you get on a plane, the, your blood le the alcohol level goes higher because the, the air gets thinner, and so you actually become more drunk. So if you're actually, if we see that you're drunk, you're not actually allowed to get on a plane because you're only going to get drunker. It's also why you're not allowed to bring your own alcohol on the plane. Just pro tip. <laughs> so got crazy Christmas spirit, and I kind of started to not like Christmas because of Christmas spirit. 
But what I've realized is, is something happens at Christmas that like everybody, we just get this kind of heightened sense of emotions within us because of Christmas. And for some of us, it's like really awesome. Like, oh, yay, it's Christmas again. It's magical and it's wonderful. And you love all the Christmas lights and the twinkling and all that. And, you know, you just always, you just love that. And you love the hot cocoa and sitting around a fire. And you're having these, envisioning the family coming over and everyone peacefully opening their presents and matching pajamas. And, you, you know, like you have this and you're like, oh, it's going to be perfect. It's just going to be perfect, right? And, and some of us, like, Come November, I'm one of those. I, I like this kind of anxiety comes over me. Maybe it's post-traumatic stress from working at the airport for Christmas spirit. But uh, where you trying to like, uh, I just kind of can't wait for it to get over. And for some people, Christmas can be really depressing for them. I was talking to a dear friend of mine and she lost her, her father this year. And she was just, she's not really a sentimental person, but she wrote me this message and she was saying, man, I, bought, I got off this Christmas ornament. And I put it up and all of a sudden this flood of memories came of my dad. And I remembered, oh, he used to do this and it drove me crazy. But then I loved that he did this. And she just got really super sentimental. And there's something about Christmas, if you haven't noticed it, it kind of just heightens our emotions one way or another. Maybe it heightens the negative emotions where you're just like, oh, I don't like this. I don't like the feelings of Christmas. Others, you're just like, it's like dreamland. Yay, joyland, joyland, wonderful girl in toyland or whatever that song is. Something gets heightened at Christmas. And I want to look at that today. And specifically, what do you do with those strong Christmas feelings that we get? Because the reality is for most of us, if we're honest, that feeling we get, usually it kind of somehow turns into a letdown. You had dreams. I hear this one a lot. You had dreams that when your son would get married, they'd bring, you'd have a new daughter and the family would just get bigger. And you're like, oh, it's going to be so amazing. My son's going to bring their, their wife. And then you just got the call last week that they're actually going to go to her parents. And you're like, oh, they're going to leave me alone at Christmas. How dare them? I'm being abandoned. And sometimes you feel this, this letdown. And, and I think for many of us, we can relate to we don't like to sit around and think about it, but many of us feel kind of a letdown after Christmas is over. Even if it was the perfect Christmas, when we all come down from it, we're kind of like, something's still missing. It made me think of something C.S. Lewis said. He said this, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. The reality is this world is always in some way going to let you down. Blaise Pascal, another philosopher, he said this. He said, there's a God-shaped vacuum inside all of us, a God-shaped hole inside all of us that can only be filled by God, our creator. Deep within us, we have this kind of longing, this desire within us for something. And it looks different for every person what it is. And maybe some of you just a deep sense of like somebody to know you and you feel so alone, like nobody really knows me or understands me. And for some, it's a deep sense of like, there's this right way that things need to be. And it's just never quite that way. And, and, and there's this deep calling within us. And I think that calling is, is God. And really the reality is only God can fill that desire within us, that thing that we're looking for. And I think that desire gets heightened at Christmas. And I don't know exactly why, but I have a theory about why. And we're going to look at a passage today of a guy named Simeon and who you've probably read over his story before because it's kind of just like a kind of a PS in the Christmas story. But it's just right after Jesus is born, it's estimated about 30 days after he was born, they brought Jesus to do uh, some sort of ceremonial thing they would do with kids uh, in the Jewish culture. And there's this guy named Simeon who's there. And this, the story Simeon, of Simeon picks up like this. It says, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. And he was a righteous and devout man. He was waiting for the Messiah, the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. And it had actually been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. So his whole life, he said, man, there's this thing that I'm just longing for. I want to see God send the Messiah to Israel. And just so happens, by coincidence, or God working providentially, he happens to show up at the very day that they bring Jesus. Now, remember, nobody knew who Jesus was at the time. It had only been revealed to, to Mary and Joseph and a handful of other, full of other people, maybe, who this was, that this was going to be the Messiah. But they happened to walk in, and they gave this child to be consecrated. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon ends up taking him, perfect God's coincidence, in his arms and praised God. He knew it, like, in an instant. He said, Sovereign God, Sovereign Lord, as you've promised... You may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. 
Can you imagine that? All of a sudden you go, this is it. This is what I've been waiting for. He's like, I can die a happy man now. (laughs) That's essentially what he said. So he goes on, which you've prepared in the sight of all nations. This will be a light of revelation to the Gentiles and to the glory of your people, Israel. Now, here's what's fascinating. Joseph and Mary, right? The holy family. The the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother. This is interesting. They marveled because, you know, you think about it. It was announced to Mary who they were giving birth to. But she had just been through a really, really traumatic nine, ten months. And you kind of, you ever had that where you like, God promises something or tell, you feel like God told you something and then everything just goes downhill really bad and you go, maybe I misheard. Maybe this is just a normal baby here. And it's interesting, they marveled. They're like, oh, wow, somebody else is confirming what God has said. And, and I, I'm, I'm more and more convinced that there comes times in li- our life where the only way that God's going to speak to you is through other people. And you go, well, wait, why? I think he can speak directly to me. He can. But I think for the sake of community and for our own humility, he will often use other people to speak to us and confirm what he's already put in our heart. And this is why it's so important to be in community with others. Because God will often speak things to you that you're never going to be able to hear on your own, but he'll speak them through community and confirm. Usually it's to confirm a word he already gave you, which is encouraging here you think about to Mary. Because you think about if you, I mean, I've never been pregnant, but I hear it's a little rough. It's been a rough nine months for her. And on top of that, on the, here's the 10th month. And then they bring Jesus in. And it's like this confirmation of everything you've been th- through. It wasn't for nothing. God's doing something here. And then, he, then Simeon gives this prophecy, which I think is fascinating. He says this, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now, this, is, this prophecy is way above my pay grade to interpret. I don't know everything that is said in here. And if anybody tells you they do, they don't. This is a very profound, deep prophecy that probably has multiple layers of meaning. But I think the crux of this message is this. How you respond to Jesus reveals what's in your heart. When Jesus is put in front of you, It shows what's really in your heart. And you see this throughout Jesus' life. The Pharisees, in their own pride, they responded to Jesus with even more pride, up to the point that they decided they wanted to kill him. But then you see other guys like Zacchaeus, who was supposedly a prideful man, but he's a short man, probably had a little man syndrome. He climbed up the top of a tree to see Jesus. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down here. I'm going to hang out with you. Jesus sensed something in him, and he responded and humbled himself before Jesus. How you respond to Jesus reveals what's really in your heart which is why I think Christmas has a way of heightening what's really in our heart. Every year, Jesus is presented to us. And it's so easy for the emotions of it to, to, to really wrap us up and show really where, what are we seeking? In fact, that, that would be my question for you today. What is it you want for Christmas? And I don't mean in the sense of like a kid would say, what do you want for Christmas? I mean, what are you wanting from Christmas? Because whether you've said it out loud or not, or whether you've just thought it in your heart as some dreamy, ideal, sentimental, idealistic thing, there's something you're wanting from the Christmas season, and this time of year just tends to heighten it within us. And I I really believe that the thing you're looking for is actually only going to be found in Jesus himself. So let's look at a couple things we look for in Christmas. I was thinking about it. What are some things we look for in Christmas? A lot of us look for the ideal or perfect Christmas. You've got the idea of, man, like I said, everybody, you know, dressed up in the the matching pajamas, all ready for this beautiful, they wake up in the morning, it's perfect, somebody flipping perfectly fluffed pancakes. There's hot cocoa, there's a roaring fire going, and there's snow, maybe, in Texas, outside, and you're going, this is the perfect Christmas. This is what ideal Christmas is. You know what you want. It's like a Hallmark movie. I think that's why people like Hallmark movies, because it's like, this is what the ideal should look like, right? For some, Christmas is about making others feel loved and cared for. The thing you want to make sure is that your family is focused on expressing care for those who are in desperate need. I grew up in Central America, and my family uh, worked with a feeding program for kids that were in just desperate poverty. And every year at Christmas, we would go out and we'd wrap up all these gifts and we'd bring teams and we'd take gifts out to the poor kids out in the villages. And I remember the last year we were in Guatemala, I was getting super sentimental. I'm like, dad, can't we just have a Christmas with just our family at home like normal people? 
And, and, and he said, no, we're going to go out and we're going to serve these kids, Joel. And I remember saying something. I was kind of a punk. I was like, dad, I'm sick of helping poor kids. Don't judge me. <laughs> and he gently grabbed me by the shoulders and he put me against the wall. I'll never forget. I was in the hallway and he said, Joel, when you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord. And I want to be about the Lord's business. And I remember, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Let's go help the poor kids. <laughs> But dad reminded me, like, it, it's easy sometimes to get so focused on having your ideal Christmas that you forget that part of it is giving to people outside here. But I also have met lots of people who like, man, I never had a normal Christmas because we were always out doing things. So there's, it's finding this balance, right? There's some people that are so externally focused, they have a hard time caring for their own, or they even feel guilty for caring for their own. And for some of you, maybe you're going to feel like Christmas isn't fulfilled until you've gone and given to others. And there's something valid to that, Right. For some, Christmas is about a big, unforgettable experience, right? We've all got the aunt. Um, you've all got the aunt that comes in with the biggest gift, you know? She comes in with, like, rents a U-Haul to bring the gifts, you know? And she's like, why, why do you have that trailer? Oh, I got all the biggest gifts for everybody. You know, they always has to outdo everybody with their gifts, right? And you write, I want a big, huge, unforgettable experience. For some, it's a unique, one-of-a-kind experience, Say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to all go cut down our own Christmas tree. And everybody's out there freezing. You know, like, are we done yet, Dad? No. This is a meaningful experience. We're going to cut down this Christmas tree. Quit complaining. For some, it's a deep, meaningful feeling about the holiday. You want to really have a, like, let's really get to Jesus is the reason for the season. You're the one that says, man, we're going to make sure that we read the Christmas story before we open presents. And everybody's chomping at the bit to open presents. You're like, no, we're going to read this Christmas story. Come on. We've got to get this right. For some, it's a sense of warmth and safety and family. It's the having everybody together, all the kids back together under your roof and you being able to provide the things they love and you know, have every, make the cake that your son loves and get everything just perfect. For others, it's joy and excitement. This is my wife, man. We can't drive by a Christmas lights thing without her having to say, stop, 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 stop. And she'll roll down the window and let all my warm air out of the window. And I'm like, I'm like, isn't this beautiful and magical? It's so magical. I love the magicalness. For some, it's a serious experience of transcendence. This is kind of what I look for. I'm a little bit more, not as lighthearted. But I'm looking for this. I want to just, I want to feel this deep sense of God's, like presence and peace. And for others, peace is what you're looking for. You just say, I don't, I don't really care if we have gifts. I just want peace. And others, you say, I just want it to be over. <laughs> I don't like the feelings around this. I don't like the feelings. So here, here's my question. Maybe you don't resonate with any of these, but there's something, if you just stop for a second and say, what is it that you're wanting out of Christmas? Because here's a little principle. Typically, how you approach anything it's how you approach everything. And there's a very good chance that what you're looking for from Christmas is actually, if you were to expand it out, what you're looking for in life. But you never feel like you can quite get it. You're seeking that thing. Maybe it's the safety or the, the childhood you never got and you're trying to relive it through your own kids. Trying to give your kids what you could never get growing up trying to make sure your kids never feel this or that or making sure that you've always got everything that you never got growing up and you go, man, I've been looking for that my whole life. Whatever it is you're looking for in Christmas, it's probably just a heightened version of what you're looking for every day in life because how you approach anything, what you're trying to get in life and anything is how you do pretty much everything. So if you're looking for safety all the time, you're probably doing that in everything. If you're trying to avoid rejection all the time, trying to please people all the time, it's probably what you're doing in everything. And this is where I think Christmas is so powerful if we stay focused on the right thing. Because the thing you're looking for from Christmas and life is what was actually given at Christmas. God became flesh, human being, and dwelt and lived among us. God himself came down and said, you know that God-shaped hole you've got in your heart that only I can fill? I'm going to send myself. It's kind of confusing. Somebody was asking me earlier, how does that work? I say, yeah, it's really confusing. I don't understand how the whole Trinity works, but God, Jesus was God in the flesh. He was part of the Godhead and he came down and he said, I'm going to fulfill all of the things you're looking for. But here's the wild thing about it. He showed up in a form that would have been really easy to overlook. He showed up as a little baby born in a cave. Jesus was probably born in a cave, by the way. He put him in a manger. That was for feeding the animals, but the, the animals were probably living in a cave. And it would have been so easy to overlook that. 
and how easy it is in our life too to overlook the fact that Jesus comes in that form when we're so busy trying to make the perfect Christmas and get all those things we're looking for. But all the things we're looking for are right there in Jesus. And that's my main point this morning. As we get ready for Christmas, I want you to not forget this. Whatever you're looking for at Christmas, whatever that thing is that you really, really want to happen this year and in life, it's only found in Jesus, which I recognize that sounds like a Sunday school answer. If you grew up in church like I did, the answer to every question is Jesus. You could go home with a lot of candy in your pocket just answering Jesus to everything. <laughs> Even if it was the wrong answer, people would be like, well, that's a good answer to everything. They'd throw candy at you, right? It sounds trite, but Jesus really is the answer to everything you're looking for. And here's the thing. It's going to look different in every one of your lives. Because some of you grew up in really traumatic backgrounds, really difficult situations, and you don't even have a picture of what an ideal Christmas could look like. But I'll tell you this. If you seek Jesus, he will show you a love and a peace and a hope and a joy that you never could have envisioned. And all the things you're trying to find it in by creating this perfect Christmas, it's only going to be found in seeking him. Whatever it is you're seeking for Christmas or in life, Jesus is that answer. And that's my prayer for us this year, that we'd stay focused on that. It's December 1st, we got 25 days till Christmas. So before you get all ramped up and let the emotions get charged and you go to the airport and start yelling at somebody, stop for a second. Please don't yell at anybody, really, for the love of all airline agents. Before you get all ramped up, take a moment, take a deep breath and say, what is it I'm looking for this year? I'm gonna make sure that I find it in the reason for the season in Jesus, because that's where you're going to find all the things you're looking for, not only at Christmas, but in life. Does that make sense? All right. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you that you came and the answer to everything we need was you, yourself. So we thank you that you didn't send a messenger. You sent yourself. You came yourself, born in the form of a baby, something easily overlooked. But Lord, you are the answer. You were God in the flesh and you came to exemplify for us what a life of living by your spirit looks like, empowered by your love, by your grace, by your confidence. So I pray for anyone this morning that's, man, maybe this is a depressing time of year for them. I pray that they just begin to find a new sense of purpose in Christmas. They may not necessarily feel this peppy, wonderful joy, but I feel like they pray they feel a deep sense that there's something bigger going on here at Christmas than just all the hype and the hoopla. And I pray for those that, Lord, maybe they easily get distracted by all of the hype and the hoopla. I pray that they just be constantly reminded to go back to what this is all about. Jesus Christ, God made flesh, came to fulfill the desire of every heart. I thank you for that this morning. If you're here this morning and you've not given your life to Jesus, I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. You already know who you are. The Holy Spirit's already been speaking to your heart. If you say this prayer and you mean it, in your heart, God is going to come and forgive your sins. And he's going to transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness, and he's going to set you up with him in eternity. Now, let's all say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way, and we turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. December 1st, 2024, great day for you. We've got some resources under the Do It Again sign to help you on your journey. I pray you guys, again, take a deep breath this week before you get all ramped up. And I just seek Jesus this year as, this season go, uh, as we get into this season. We'll see you next, uh, next week on Sunday. Have a great week. Be blessed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.